in our team we had people who had different backgrounds so one mm-hmm. of the things as a leader is to be able to encourage ideas and not just shut down ideas in terms of what could work mm-hmm. and pick the best that can work for the situation because mm-hmm. generally when you are in a context it's not a cookie cutter solution that oh yeah i did this in my previous company let's put it in here is generally not the best solution mm-hmm. what i recommend even for founders is you, it's actually good to have these frameworks but go back to your first principles on what are you trying to achieve Hi, Sri. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I am excited to be here. Thanks for having me. To start the show, I want to give the audience a little bit of background of how you got to where you are today, and I would love to like hear the same story from you. The first exposure for you to like in- encounter like a computer is like your uncle bought a home、uh, ZX Spectrum computer. When you got it, you were so excited, and then you didn't really sleep for like three days. And after school, you started your career as a software engineer in Siemens. Later on, you worked at some Microsystem, Ning,、uh, VMware, and as a C. You have Groupon and Atlassian. What an incredible career journey! I just want to say, like, this is like super impressive. And to start off the show, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about, like, you know, what you have learned early on in your career to where you are now. Th- thank you for、uh, the intro. I've been lucky to be part of the amazing companies and experience.、Uh, it- it's been an incredible journey overall in terms of just learning、uh, and going through different experiences in all these different companies. Uh, let me go all the way back and just walk you through, I guess, just my thinking of how I did what I did. I guess in terms of learnings、mm-hmm. and all the way back, I guess growing up, there were two core principles that I was、mm-hmm. brought up on that I think st- stuck with me all through my career. Right. So,、mm-hmm. uh, first one was hard work. I would see my dad working on a Sunday, and one of those Sundays, I went to him and just like, Dad. Why are you working? Is somebody going to check you? It's like、mm-hmm. no, because I have to do this. This is my job. It's like wow, like nobody is praising him, but he's still doing it. Like that stuck with me all through, and I core in、uh, heart of hearts believe that working hard is one of the most important things that I do in terms of making sure that I can、uh, do all the things that I've done. And the second thing is、uh, this learning and being curious and. Just a continuous learning concept. My mom was a physics professor, so she would always throw new concepts at me. And、uh, even from early days, I was always curious about learning. How does that work? How does this work? And why does that happen that way? And th- that stuck with me even through my career, in terms of just being able to focus and learn on new things. And even every change that I did was essentially the decision making came down to: Am I going to learn something new? Being、mm-hmm. in the new job, so th- 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 that essentially was、uh, a driving factor. As I,、uh, I'm happy to walk through different companies, but one of the things that I also learned in my very first job at Sun was caring about people and basic like management principles on how do you manage people.、Mm-hmm. And that again stuck with me through the rest of my career. When you first started your career, like one of your manager, like when you guys were going to like a Star Wars movie, and then one of the manager just like wait for the last person to join you guys to watch the movie, otherwise he wouldn't go in. And then like later on, when the person came, and then there was like just only one ticket left, and he gave it to the team member, and then waited for you guys outside. And I just thought like that lesson was like really resonating with me on like what leadership looks like. And I'm curious from having these. Really interesting experiences, as well as like these like great mentors in your life. Who is on your like personal board of advisors when it comes to leadership, and、uh, how do you kind of find the role model for yourself, as well as like guiding yourself into leading these huge organizations later on? I've been lucky to have mentors in pretty much every place that I've been,、uh, and I've also made a point to go back and seek advice whenever、mm-hmm. I need to make hard decisions.、Right. I- I'll give you an example. Uh, th- th- I was doing my、uh, MBA at Stanford, and、mm-hmm. one of the classes professors、uh, professor asked us to write a ten year vision paper.、Uh, it was actually a mid term exam, so I had to write it. I didn't have a choice, and it had to be about like real thing, not fiction.、Mm-hmm. So one of the things I was contemplating during that time was whether to stay on a technology track or whether to become a manager leader. And I was completely torn because I was born. 
Like I, I, as growing up, I was like, oh, I wanted to be a technologist, like pure mm-hmm. technologist. I wanted to be a distinguished engineer at Sun. So I was on the track, but then uh, I started doing my MBA degree because I wanted to broaden my knowledge and wanted to learn more things. And and this was hard. Like the, for that weekend was like inter- I talked to all my mentors and I wrote down uh, like what I wanted to be in ten years. But you asked the question about mentors. So for those kinds of decision making, I guess relying on people to be able to call up and say, this is what I have. And the thing people don't realize, it's not that they'll give you the answer. What it helps is it also helps you additional dimensions of what you can think through when you are trying to solve a problem. And this happens to me too. Uh, I enjoy working with founders now. Uh, I spend a lot of time with founders and helping them decide and helping them make choices, mm-hmm. helping them uh, to grow and scale the company. And I tell them in the beginning, I don't have answers for you, but what I can help you is to think through the problem so that you can mm-hmm. make a better choice at the end. And and that's been the case even for me. And just completing the story, I wrote down this vision paper where I said, mm-hmm. I wanted to be a VP of engineering in a startup running 100 people. <laughs> Uh, in 10 years. And then I gave it to my manager and he looked at it, flipped through and he said, oh, you want my job? (laughs) But uh, but it was good because he knew what I wanted to be. And then uh, subsequently in some years, I was a VP of engineering in a startup and uh, it it all worked out well, but mentors definitely helped. And the other thing that I should should also add is uh, my family has been super supportive in all these decisions and Mm -hmm. especially my wife. I generally run it by her and she mm-hmm. always listens pros and cons and just asks basic questions, but it's so helpful to just think through. And she's always been supportive for me making these calls. So that I think is also a rock bed in terms of making decisions. What would be like one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at? It could be like, you know, the soft skill, like sales or like convincing people, or coaching people. What would you say were like one skill that you're constantly trying to improve? Yeah, th- th- there are lots of things that uh, I keep learning. I love to read different kinds of books in different fields and things like that. But one of the things that has stayed constant is communication skills. Mm-hmm. I still remember back when I was in undergrad, even before that, maybe I was walking with my friend Mm. and he asked me, oh, what do you want to be? And he's like, oh, what do you want to be? And he was like, oh, I want to do my MBA and become a manager. And at that point, I was like, oh, wow, I can't do that. Like, I can't communicate Mm -hmm. well. I'm not a good leader. I don't think one of the things that that I realized afterwards is all these skills can be learned. Mm. And that that's something that stuck with me saying, even if I don't know something, if I keep working on it for a while, I can improve on things. O- on that topic, I guess what I've been trying to learn is, the, first of all, for the first 10 years of my schooling, I didn't even have English. I, mm. I studied in a local language school uh, in a smaller place near Bangalore in India. So I had no English. So I came to uh, Bangalore for my seventh grade. And that was hard because I was in an English school and we had to speak English and I couldn't speak English. So for one full year, I didn't speak. And that was always in my mind was like, oh, I need to improve. And that's something that I've been working on every chance that I get, every place that I go, uh, I keep working on things. But more importantly, I guess, at every place that I've been, if I reflect back, hindsight, it's 2020, I didn't know what I was doing, I guess, or what I was learning in the moment. But Mm -hmm. if I look back, Every place that I've been, I've learned a very important skill that I think has helped me become a better leader, better manager, better now helping uh, founders. Sun was an amazing people-focused place. So the people management uh, Mm -hmm. was all uh, at Sun Microsystems. Then I went to the startup Ning. Uh, It was a startup life, so learning a startup life, learning technology leadership, having great Mm -hmm. mentors to rely on and learn from and the cloud computing and uh, Groupon was high scale, so I learned how to mm-hmm. run an organization at a higher scale. Uh, then I went to Atlassian. Atlassian is really good in teamwork. I hadn't fully appreciated mm-hmm. what it means by having an amazing teamwork culture. Mm-hmm. And also, I guess, being part of the executive team to be able to have a strategy and to be able to drive a strategy for the longer term as a CTO. In my Stanford, one of the things that I was like, and especially as a upbringing, we were focused on, you need to do what 
you've been told, like especially in the mm-hmm. culture that we grew up in. Mm-hmm. And Stanford changed completely that. It uh, basically challenged me saying, you should challenge status quo. Mm-hmm. And th- that was revolutionary for me personally, given my mm-hmm. upbringing. And we had this exercise where we should, we went and challenged every saying or common quotes that we had. And then I was like, wow, I can actually go back and challenge everything that I had assumed before. Mm-hmm. And that, that also helped out. And then during angel investing in the last several years, and now as a VC, uh, learning about technology trends and markets and thinking much more broader picture and to be able to hone in on what's good to invest in. So there's lots of these skills that I've learned over time. Mm-hmm. And my main message to listeners is you can learn it too, right? Because mm-hmm. I could ask me, I would be like, of course, I don't know anything, but now I know something. So it's possible mm-hmm. to be able to get to learn all this. You know, there's so many really good technical people in the Bay Area. And what do you think makes you the CTO of like a big company? What do you think separate you apart from the rest of the crowd? I would definitely say there are a lot more better technical people than me. There are much better communicators than me. This, If you look at each of these fields, mm-hmm. I can definitely think of people who reported to me who are much better. The, the thing that I did uh, during my career, I guess, is to focus and going back to my principles on hard work and being curious and to be able to do your best job at your mm-hmm. uh, at your role that you are in. I focused on doing the best I could, not because my manager said so, not because somebody else had goals, mm-hmm. but because intrinsically I believed I had to do the best I could. Mm-hmm. And that had, that helped me to grow at each level. And people assume that, oh, wow, CTO, he had all these skills, but I didn't have all those skills at all. You don't need all those skills at all the levels mm-hmm. that uh, you grow into. And uh, as I mentioned, I learned different skills at different points of time, and they all added it up in terms of when I went into Atlassian, I was tasked to build out the cloud for Atlassian and Atlassian uh, primarily was a on-prem company. So when I went in, there were a number of things that I had to do in terms of I had to build out a team to be able to have a cloud organization. I had to build out the products on cloud. I had to have new practices in place. Uh, I had to choose technology. Uh, but the the thing I went back was going back to my first principles on having the right people uh, mm-hmm. lets you like get the right people on the bus and then you can mm-hmm. figure out where to drive and you can always change directions. Help me, right? I, I built out a leadership team that was stellar that helped me with making all these decisions and to be able to tackle all the other pieces. Uh, and then we could f- focus on making decisions and choosing technology. And so th- that teamwork of having and for all the things that I said, it's the team that actually delivered. And I may take, like I, I shouldn't be taking all the kudos. It should be the team that worked with me that helped me build all this. But what mm-hmm. I did focus on was to be able to allow the team to be able to execute and make those decisions, remove any hurdles in place, and to build out the stellar team that could execute on this. When you first enter Atlassian, what were some like actions that you took to actually get to know the team and the product? And then second, like, you know, you wrote papers on like scaling up like engineering productivity. You talk about the space, which is satisfaction, performance, activity, communication, and efficiency to like help the developers to increase their productivity. You built like basically all of these like really amazing systems as well as like, you know, the Atlassian like engineering handbook and like all these like kind of like guidance on how to build like a good engineering culture. How do you execute based on this giant leadership principle, you know, throughout a company? <laughs> yeah, no, th- that's a great question. So if you read the handbook, it feels like, wow, we architected the whole thing all at once. But that's not the case. Because what happened was, when I went in, we were maybe a few hundred people in engineering. Mm-hmm. And we grew over the period of six and a half years, seven years, to 7,000 people, 6,500 mm-hmm. people. And it, it it was a set of principles and uh, practices. It was definitely ongoing work in terms of to be able to scale to that level. The things that we set up in the first year had to be redone after some years because that's how it is. But the good part was because we were we could choose all the technologies on the cloud, mm-hmm. I could make choices like going native on AWS and we could go... Uh, and take these principles on being able to use the services to be able to have more customer focus and laying down the strategic principles and to work with the team to be able to get 
to the goal that we wanted mm-hmm. to get. So we went through those things. And one of the principles, because we were at a teamwork company, we wanted to have this process bottoms up, not a mm-hmm. mandate from top down. So mm-hmm. Uh, I was striving hard to be able to give as much room to engineers to be able to innovate Mm -hmm. while putting these guardrails in place and to be able to get the team to move in the right direction. So if you see, read the handbook, you'll see many of the processes that are there are not typical top-down processes. You see Mm -hmm. things like scorecards and things which are more bottoms up in terms of how it's Mm -hmm. run. But we also built tools so that we could run a uh, an organization that delivers on the mission that we had. When you first like enter the job or something that you've been doing to kind of like get to know the existing like engineering culture. And then you mentioned like the handbook was like built throughout time. Did you come up with like the general structure first and then like letting people contribute later on throughout these like smaller scope of category of things? Or like how do you organize this huge amount of detail related management concept? Yeah, we put together the writing that handbook at the end was actually slightly the easier part. Getting those principles and the practices to work internally was actually the core hard work that we had Mm. to do. Uh, Like I said, I had a stellar team. I had an amazing engineering leaders. I had a stellar HR leader because we had to also do the career ladders and roll Mm -hmm. that out and build all the promotion processes and working with the rest of the HR team. So having a stellar HR person having a working with the marketing and go to market teams to be able to figure out i guess where to invest in because atlassian is also a mm-hmm. bottom sub company in terms of mm-hmm. go to market we mm-hmm. had to build many of the features traditionally run by go to market into the product so mm-hmm. there was also all this collaboration beyond just product and engineering that mm-hmm. we also had to build out even before i uh, joined atlassian it was an amazing culture great teamwork so th- that was already the the foundation of what could be built was already there. Mm. I came in to build out the cloud and help accelerate, I guess, making those decisions and to be able to build the cloud native version uh, th- that helped Atlassian to build the cloud and the premium version and the enterprise version that uh, exists today and basically convert from an on-prem company to a cloud company. Mm. But Atlassian definitely has amazing leadership beyond just the engineering in terms of amazing founders, great executive leadership team, uh, and a culture that that was there. So that existed. I got to build out my CTO leadership team, which was spectacular, the best I've seen in terms of, and we worked together for a number of years, the same group of people to be able to have the continuity. Mm -hmm. Uh, At some point, we were hiring a lot and there were lots of new people coming in. So we wanted to write a handbook, not for external people, but mostly for new people coming in Mm -hmm. because they wanted to learn how things were done. So we had all these different pages and I worked with Mike, uh, 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 another VP who was on my org, and uh, he helped a lot to put it all together. Uh, And then we gave it to the new people coming in. At some point, I was like, oh, wow, this can actually be put Mm -hmm. outside because people who are interviewing can also help out to see Mm -hmm. how we do things. And that's how we Mm -hmm. cleaned it up and we put it outside. I feel like you guys are really effectively building all these systems. And then do you create tutorials for the internal people to look at? Or like, how do you kind of make sure that people actually look at it and understand it? You also mentioned that like you would work with HR team or like, you know, working with like other team members who are having the right incentive to map out people's career track to help Mm -hmm. them succeed within the organization to retain talent and how do you kind of like incentivize people or like motivate people to follow this structure yeah th- there are a number of things there in terms of le- let's focus on career ladder we explicitly decided to have a dual track in terms of mm-hmm. people management and individual contribution to be mm-hmm. all the way the same in terms of mm-hmm. parallel structure and it's becoming a common practice but we decided this early on Uh, And we wrote down, what does it mean by operating at every level? Mm -hmm. And what does it take to go from level A to level B? Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, and uh, there's actually a blog uh, that uh, I wrote that's out there um, Mm -hmm. on this, on the principles on how we chose and what we did. And uh, uh, again, I should classify, there's a lot of people that worked on it, not just me on uh, on this whole project. Mm -hmm. Uh, The thing that 
it became like the core backbone of all the other people related practices that we layered on afterwards in terms of to be able to promote people. How do you hire people? How do you hire at the right level? All that was because we defined this core principles and this table. Mm -hmm. And it was not one table. It was table of the number of tables because it was for specific job description to job roles. Mm -hmm. We had separate ladders for each one of them. And we didn't do all at once. We did one, we fine tuned it, and then we did the next one, made sure it worked. Mm -hmm. And we used that as part of the review, performance review process, promotion process, hiring process. So we brought it all together in terms of a cohesive framework. I'm curious, like, what does your information dial look like? How do you kind of like coming up with these solutions and structures? Is this like a common practices in like the engineering culture or how does it work? Yeah. So one of the things going back to even your previous questions, one of the things Atlassian had was a value of open company, no bullshit. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we were pretty transparent on what we did with the organization and also pretty transparent outside because... Atlassian also publishes all the mm -hmm. road enterprise roadmap and things like that. So th that was there. Uh, Atlassian has this product called Confluence, which is a content management system, and we used mm -hmm. it across everything that mm -hmm. we did. So everybody wrote blogs and articles internally. Mm -hmm. So that helped in terms of just putting down on paper. And we avoided any PowerPoint presentation. So it was mm -hmm. all written format. So mm -hmm. everything was written, even in meetings. So we would sit together and read for first 15 minutes before we had a discussion rather than having somebody present. Mm -hmm. So all that helped out to just put everything down on paper. Mm -hmm. And even for new people coming in, that's how they could learn all things that were already there. And that's mm -hmm. a practice that I recommend uh, even startups in terms of write down your principles and practices. And because even if you hire 10 people, it actually mm -hmm. helps those 10 people. And you also, when you write it down, it's actually more so for yourself because you write down a draft and it's like, oh, wow, I can make it better. And then after like 24 hours, it actually is a much better framework than you mm -hmm. had in your brain. And it's yeah. easy to communicate, easy to have it afterwards because even you forget. So it's more for the author uh, as well and not just for other people. So writing it down helps out. And we use that for uh, lots of things and also for the handbook that you that you mentioned. What kind of content do you typically consume to coming up with like different solutions for different technical challenges as well as like the management challenges? Uh, there are a number of uh, aspects to this. I guess in our team, we had people who had different backgrounds. So one mm -hmm. of the things as a leader is to be able to encourage ideas and not just shut down ideas in terms of what could work mm -hmm. and pick the best that can work for the situation. Because mm -hmm. generally, when you're in a context, it's not a cookie cutter solution that, oh yeah, I did this in my previous company, let's put it in here. It's mm -hmm. generally not the best solution. Mm -hmm. What I recommend even for founders is, you, it's actually good to have these frameworks, but go back to your first principles on what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And if you step back and think your first principles, then you can build up your framework on top. So the, what we did was we did lots of research and we had our own experiences and these are the kinds of things that you could do. And there are lots of books that you read in terms of whether it's technical, whether it's people management, and then you take the best parts of it and customize it to what you need for your culture. Mm -hmm. And th th that's definitely a recommendation uh, that, that I have even for founders starting companies and uh, VCs trying to figure out, I guess, how to learn certain areas and things like that. You were the CTO. How did you come up with like KPI for yourself as well as like your team? And then basically when you joined the team, it was like, you know, 500 people. And then when you left, it was like 5,000 people. Basically, you scale the company from a very small team to like a really huge company. What do you focus on first in terms of like product and then, you know, reaching certain level of like revenue or reaching certain level of scale in terms of like how big the company is? How do you think about what is your core KPI throughout your time as a, yeah. As a CTO? Yeah, for, for execution, there are a number of dimensions you need to think through. One of the things you ask KPI, so there, we had this uh, scorecards, KPIs, mm -hmm. things that you had to meet a certain level. So when you're running mm -hmm. a cloud organization, you want to have a 99.99, whatever, mm -hmm. three nines, four nines, five nines, a SLA. You want to have security at a certain level and things like that. So there's all these things that you need to meet a bar and you need to have a system that you can keep upping that bar over time, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one set of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and for, for each of them, there's different ways of how you set up goals and KPIs. And then mm -hmm. we had this OKR mechanism that we used 
for mm. at the company level, we had OKRs where OKRs are this objective key results. And mm. for that, those are those objectives are not like an incremental change, but it's a step mm. change from where you are. So mm. you pick three to five things that you want to achieve as a company mm -hmm. that makes the most uh, impact in the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on scope, if you are a smaller company, maybe six months, three months next year, and then pick few things that you want to achieve as an org. And the question that you need to ask yourself is, if you only do this and nothing else, is that what you want to achieve? And then you want to have these goals that at every level in your organization map back to the company level goals. Mm -hmm. And then we were we decided the company level goals. And then I would say, okay, I'm going to focus on org building on this side, product on this and practices. I want to have this career ladder done this quarter. And then technology wise, we want to have whatever data systems built out and mm. delivery on these five things delivered. So those all came afterwards, but it started with the company level things and mapping down what you wanted to achieve. So when you are planning the goals for the next year, how do you kind of like set a realistic goal and, you know, a goal that you feel like it could take the company to the next level? So th th there are a number of functions uh, that, that I managed in terms of engineering, IT, security. Mm -hmm. There are some partnerships and product pieces and things like that for each of them had their own fitness functions ob mm -hmm. objectives in terms of what had to be achieved uh, for security for example we had to implement number of practices we had uh, measurements on different uh, categories on what we had to do we were red in some cases wanted to get to yellow wanted to yellow to get to green and there mm -hmm. was a three-year uh, roadmap on how do we keep improving things mm -hmm. then there's all the operational side where you had to improve your operational processes and uh, reduce your mean time to recovery and reduce the number of incidents. So there's all the operational aspects. There's all the product feature development and platform development and delivering certain things. So each of them had its own set of status. So there's no cookie cutter. These are the three things you should have. Mm -hmm. But I think you should consider all the things on where you are and strategically what makes the best impact. And for most companies you have more than what you can do actually do in the next three months. So it's very important to have that maniacal focus on reducing to a limit where you can mm. actually deliver rather than signing up for more things and not delivering. But the OKR mechanism also gives you this leverage of scoring. We scored these mm -hmm. things on a scale of one to 10 mm -hmm. and or zero to one in terms of <laughs> point, one point. 0.7 or 7 was like the expected level. And then mm -hmm. if you did really great, you could get to a one daughter. Mm -hmm. So there was room to say you achieved this much, but if you did really great, you would over exceed on things. So we could actually measure if teams were executing just to what they signed up for, below what they signed up for, or overachieving what they set for. And it's important to have a culture where people don't, sandbag things and overachieve or overcommit mm -hmm. and underachieve, right? So you want to be mm -hmm. transparent in knowing what they're signing up for and make sure that they all have some consistency and then it's easier to measure at a larger scale. In a smaller scale, it's a lot easier to be nimble and uh, move faster. A lot of our listeners are running smaller companies. How could we like kind of implement these either like blameless culture and to like build, learn and adapt into the system? And then I also just from my personal curiosity, because I'm not a technical founder in Silicon Valley, there's basically the unspoken rule is like you have to have a technical founder. If I want to like, you know, meet someone like a younger version of you, what kind of characteristics should I have in my own to partner with someone who's like great in like the technical scaling aspect? And then what are some characteristics should I look for in like a technical founder that can do, you know, what you have accomplished? That, that's a great question. In, in fact, you'll have AI solutions soon mm -hmm. that makes you more technical than you think. But anyway, we can talk about AI uh, later. 90% of what I said mm -hmm. and I've been seeing in, in the last uh, half an hour, it's actually a place to not just the technical aspects, but for general principles for anything mm -hmm. that we do. It so happens that I ran a engineering org, but I also had partnerships org and mm -hmm. non-technical organization program management and uh, IT org and things like that. So I had more than just engineers in my org. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and m- most of these principles were actually similar principles that HR teams had and other teams might have had. Uh, so so th- that that's number one. And second is hiring is an extremely important aspect. And I spend a lot of time with uh, my portfolio or portfolio companies to be able to have a good system and mechanism to hire people. Right? Mm. Because uh, like I said, people are the most important thing. Hiring is the most important job uh, as a founder. So, mm-hmm. and hiring a co-founder is like the most important of all the things that you do. <laughs> when you look for a co-founder, whether it's technical or non-technical, uh, there, there are specific skill set that you want to have. One of the things is you need the person needs to compliment you to be able mm-hmm. to have a much more well-rounded team. That's mm-hmm. number one. The chemistry is extremely important. The, the, the two or three founders that uh, work together, they have to be mm-hmm. like extremely uh working well together. Mm -hmm. And it helps if you know this person from a long time rather than just getting to know and starting together. So it's good Mm -hmm. to get to know the person for a while before you say, yeah, let's do a one hour interview and hire this person as a co-founder is probably not Mm -hmm. a good idea. Uh, That that said, there's there are lots of technical people and uh, I spend a lot of time with founders there are lots of technical founders who want to have complementary co-founders who have communication skills, go-to-market skills, sales skills, and vice versa, mm-hmm. right? So we have it all the time. And having two people is actually great for a company to be able to scale and go through rough patches, which always happens. It's never the case that, uh, or rarely the case that you pick a direction and that's all you do and everything is up on to the right. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always hard cases. There's always this bank that goes down and then you have to handle it. This, these things happen all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you need to have an awesome team that can move fast and work together well and have the trust uh, mm-hmm. of each other. What are some like characteristics we look for in like a co-founder? Some of the listeners are not technical. How can we, I wouldn't say screen the skills because we wouldn't be able to speak the technical language to having a good look on like, you know, what we need in the next yeah. two years, five years in going forward yeah. in terms of technology. And yeah. Yeah. For specifically assessing the technical skills. I would say rely on some mentors Mm -hmm. and for people who have hired technical people because Mm -hmm. it it helps to make sure that the person, uh, depending on the the type of company and what type of skills you need, if you are building a product company, you want a technical founder who is a product thinker, Mm -hmm. want to be uh, having empathy for customers and want to build only the things that you need to build and not anything else and want to use to be able to use let's say an AI chat GPT and build mm-hmm. on top rather than building your own, training your own. Like, mm-hmm. th- there's considerations that you want to have uh, depending on whether you're a product company, services company, infrastructure mm-hmm. company, right? Or whether it's a non-technical company, but you want to build certain things outside. So, and even in the companies that I've been, they've all had uh, different needs, even for a CTO, right? Mm-hmm. So Groupon was an e-commerce company and the role that I had was different than what I had at Atlassian versus like Ning, which was a uh, much smaller startup. So it, it depends, but to assess the technical skills, I, I would say if you're a non-technical person, absolutely rely on somebody who has been there, done that. And mm. I've lived in the Valley. It's a tight knit community. People want to help. They will help, right? If you mm-hmm. seek for help. And that's something that you can absolutely do. You invest in like many AI companies. One of like my favorite of your investment is like Stability AI. You know, in terms of like investing in top AI companies, like what is your general outlook in AI and how do you encounter Stability AI? And then why do you feel like it was a great company to like pull the trigger on? First of all, I came into investing because I did angel investing for the last few years and mm-hmm. I loved working with the founders. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and the energy uh, in the startup ecosystem is amazing and I'm loving it. Mm-hmm. Second is, uh, you, you mentioned earlier the story where I got my first computer in three days, I didn't sleep. And mm-hmm. it, basically I, I was looking at it and said, wow, this is going to change everything. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel the same way with AI. It's like mm-hmm. AI is going to change everything. It's already changing everything, but there's so much happening that it's going to be a huge disruption in some cases, augmentation in many cases, like in the next five years, it's going to be like Mm -hmm. revolutionary, which is pretty amazing in terms of what it is. Uh, Specifically, I guess, 
Koto is a, a technology leading technology investment firm. Uh, we are very data driven. We have mm-hmm. a team of passionate company builders, which is a combination of investors and uh, you know, operators like me who have been uh, in in companies. And, and we focus on investing in technology startups, all the different stages of a uh, of a company. And I've been like angel investing before, but as a as a VC for the last six, seven, eight months, like. There are a number of aspects when you look at a company, right? So first of all, people are founders are extremely important. So you assess a founder, uh, similar to, I guess, how you were hiring before, but then there are specific characteristics of a founder that you look for, for leadership and uh, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, Second is the market. It's, so mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, is disrupting lots of things and augmenting uh, and improving productivity. So having a thesis uh, is extremely mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. And Koto, for example, has been doing AI investments even before I started. It, we invested in leading AI companies like Scale.ai, Hugging Face, and Weights and Biases, mm-hmm. and several other companies even before, and lots of data companies uh, even before I started. And I'm essentially helping uh, speed that up and lead uh, this effort uh, to take it uh, to the next level. So the market extremely important to be able to assess. A- mm-hmm. And then you have this, what idea is the company trying to do? What's the vision of the founder? Uh, is the timing right for this company? A- and if you see there are lots of disruption happening, what layer in the stack it is, What's uh, how does it fit in? And do they have a differentiation? So that's important for early stages. And for later stage companies, I guess it's important to see how much uh, revenue they are generating. What's the go-to-market motion, and it's the technology that they have built, and the culture. There's different ways of evaluating different companies. And in the last six, seven months, uh, I've invested in several companies, Stability mm-hmm. being one of them. And for each of them, the framework that I said on looking through different things, and it's not that everything matches everything, but you need to be able to say, "Wow, this company has a big future." That's double down on the founder and make sure that we can invest and help the company. And we as a firm spend a lot of time, not just me on a company that I invest, the whole firm helps out in uh, scaling, getting contacts and making sure that we can uh, do whatever it takes to help Mm -hmm. the company uh, go to the next level. Curious, like what is your general outlook as well as like specific thesis that you have in different sectors? And then what is, how will AI change things from like a financial perspective? Since we're talking about investment, like return on investment is like extremely important. What are some sectors that AI would tackle to make the most change in like the financial ecosystem and like in tech? Let's step back before we talk about mm-hmm. AI. Like every technology mm-hmm. disruption in the past, mm-hmm. like going all the way back to industrial revolution, uh, railways, right? and mm-hmm. even in the recent ones where internet and uh, mobile, mm-hmm. uh, all these different trends, social, all these different trends, I guess, dislocated certain things, augmented uh, c- certain areas, mm-hmm. but overall made our lifestyle much better in terms of to be able to have access mm-hmm. to data and content and decision making and uh, helping out connect even the remotest areas. And mm-hmm. uh, so o- overall, I guess it's been a overall net positive benefit mm-hmm. in terms of being able to help overall humanity. Mm-hmm. And I take the same stance even for AI. It's, mm-hmm. There's going to be lots of issues in terms of to get this right over time. Uh, what generally happens is people overestimate what changes in the next two years and underestimate what changes in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if you zoom forward 10 years, lots and lots of things are going to be different, Mm. right? Uh, Even now you can see like the code generation tools like GitHub Copilot, Mm -hmm. like people accept 40% uh, of the times the recommendation that it gives, which Mm -hmm. is like pretty amazing. And uh, I use number of code generation tools Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, changed how I develop completely. Mm. And I can see how even like people out of college can be a lot Mm. more productive because there's all these recommendations coming in and uh, augmenting developers to be, we used to talk about 10X developers, 
Mm-hmm. And AI is going to create 100x developers, 1000x developers very pretty quickly, right? So mm-hmm. it's going to change from specific developers building products mm-hmm. all the way to different industries, different markets completely, right? So, and we should look at it in, in a couple of dimensions in terms of it augments and improves productivity. That's the first mm-hmm. thing. When that happens, you probably don't need as many people that you had because you can get it done in a smaller group. So there may be some dislocation, but they all move up the stack in terms of mm-hmm. engaging in more creative work and ha- helping out with uh, things that, yeah, you can't do, but then the combination of humans and AI can do a lot better, a lot faster. The other aspect is AI also unlocks things that we could never solve before. And there are a number of companies that we work with that's solving like curing diseases and building biotechnologies and uh, science technology. There's all these applications of AI in fields that can make it so that it actually improves directly the quality of life and the lifestyle of humans. Mm. Right. So I'm actually very excited in terms of, uh, and like I said, there are issues that as an industry we need to work through, but I love the fact that we can work through this in open and solve this. And we have done this number of times in the past in terms mm-hmm. of all the technology changes and revolutions that have happened. And I'm confident as a uh, as a technology uh, market and group that we have, we can work well with everybody else and make sure that we can solve these problems for the larger good. So what is the general outlook for the work if you want to like work in tech in 2030? And, you know, right now, like in Silicon Valley, still all the technical founder driven startup are like getting a lot more funding than people who are non-technical or doing consumer tech or anything like that. What are some shifts you will see from like the founder's ability from in the past? Maybe it was coding or like being able to implement the newest technology into their company. And then like, what will that shift? in the next 10 years? We will have non-technical people mm-hmm. becoming programmers mm-hmm. in gradual steps. All these mm-hmm. happens mm-hmm. in gradual steps. Mm-hmm. Like it's not going to be all at the same time and not all industries. Some industries are much slower to adopt mm-hmm. technology. Some are faster. ChatGPT went from launching to 100 million users in a mm-hmm. few months. It, 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 it's possible that it some can replace faster, but overall, if for the industry to change, it takes much longer. So uh, even if a technology that's pretty amazing that exists, it actually takes a number of years to be able to be effective in the market, in companies, in the industries. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect is it's actually good to start learning and working with the technologies like Mm -hmm. ChatGPT and other open source products and projects that you have if you're a non-technical user, because even as a non-technical uh, founder, like you can now mm. do more things that you could do before, and that's only going to be much better. It's not like you can develop a whole product all at once now, but that's going to happen at some point. But you can be a lot more productive even in the meantime. Right? Mm. And th- th- that's something that we'll start seeing across the board. If you look at people trying to, I guess, in technology industry, you said 2030, that's like seven years out. The, 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 there's going to be uh, higher, much higher productivity in terms of what we can do, more products that are much simpler with more chat-like interface, more robots that can do automate stuff. Uh, the generative AI is helping out. One of the things I should say, if you go back several years, people would think, oh, blue-collar workers would lose jobs uh, or would get uh, automated out. But it's not the case. It's actually happening both on because of generative AI. It's already helping out even the creators. And I wrote this in one of the blogs or podcasts where the cost of content goes down mm-hmm. significantly. To and near that's zero. happening to near zero. And the thing is that allows people to focus on the more creative aspects of how do you work with these AI to bring multiple mm-hmm. things together and to create something that you couldn't create before. Mm. And the time that it takes for you to create something shrinks significantly. And the effort that you need to put in also becomes a lot easier and easier to work with. And that that also frees up time to do things that you always wanted to do 
and to be more productive at the end of the day. We can see a lot of like people were really polarizing about that idea of is AI actually creating anything? Because some people are like, oh, we love this, like because of the AI will help us to improve our work productivity. And then there's a lot of people who are really panic about like AI will replace human completely and stuff like that. I'm curious, number one is like, what's your thoughts on these kind of like things? What are jobs yeah. that will be replaced? And then what are jobs that won't be replaced by AI? Th th that discussion is not very productive productive in terms of whether mm -hmm. it's generating something or not. The, mm -hmm. the angle that I look at is it is helping people now, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a lot of routine work people do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's several use cases where it's like, oh, it's hard for me to write this email and mm -hmm. you give it to AI and it generates an email. Maybe not mm -hmm. perfect, but it's a good starting point. And humans do this too, where you draw mm -hmm. from previous experiences and create something. And if you ask AI the right prompts, it can also do similar things. And then you can add your flavor on top. And not that you have to add it yourself. You can tell AI to add your flavor on top, right? So it, it absolutely helps with that kind. If you, it, it, again, it's hard to predict the future. That's a, uh, it, and if you had asked anybody last year, nobody would have predicted exactly what's happening today. But what you can see a trend is over time, it is going to be more AI across all aspects of what you can see. One of the trends that we have right now is co-pilot for everything, right? So you, you'll have co-pilot as if you're doing a job, you'll have a co-pilot that makes you better, faster, right? So that's already coming. There's also in number of places, it's better than humans in terms of not just augmenting what you do, like reading x-rays and reading uh, all this, um, tests that you have, AI is better than humans today, right? Not mm -hmm. just in the future, it's already happening today. So it helps doctors to be able to save more lives than they could before. It's not that they it eliminates doctors, it actually helps doctors to be more effective in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing that uh, we all need to uh, focus on as it changes is the best thing for listeners, I guess, to think through is how can you be nimble and fast enough to be able to adapt to this. And this adaptability becomes even more important when things change exponentially. Right? Mm. And things are changing exponentially in terms of uh, the change is not just linear, it's actually exponential, right? It's mm -hmm. accelerating in terms of uh, how much things are changing. So the best thing to do is to be able to keep up and learn all the things that are happening, to be able to change quickly when something changes. And you may have to change jobs move up a level, use better tools to be able to do this. Uh, in some cases, maybe you'll have to change jobs to be able to do something that's more interesting, but that's the fun of it in terms of you can actually get to learn and do more things as AI comes into our lives. You have seen so many like interesting AI companies. What are some benchmarks you use to evaluate if AI company is a good investment? Because I've seen a lot of like sector specific adaptation based on the existing OpenAI's giant database on GPT-4 or like anything. So basically it's like, uh, I see a lot of startups are creating the surface level layer of like how to use ChatGPT as a backend and to generate stuff, for example, marketing or like email writing or a picture what are some company that you've seen are doing something more like fundamental and like in the infrastructure level or anything that's helping people to leverage ai to the next level yeah th there's fundamental changes happening at all layers of the stack mm -hmm. uh, and uh, gpt4 itself is a fundamental architectural chain that the, the mm -hmm. transformers that came in uh, several years ago and there mm -hmm. are a number of companies that are building similar large models. Uh, and so there, there's innovation happening at that layer. There's mm -hmm. also innovation happening at the lower layers in the infrastructure layer to be able to mm -hmm. uh, get the data into the right shape, to be able to train mm -hmm. the models, to be able to inference or run the models more effectively uh, and fast. And the cost used to be much higher and the cost of running these and training and running these models are going down significantly. And the trend all is, I think is going to be the same, uh, meaning you'll have smaller models that are as efficient and running faster. So that trend is happening mm -hmm. and there's a number of companies focus on that. And then the number of product companies that are using these models to be able mm -hmm. to build uh, products for the last mile, for the customers, for the consumers, mm -hmm. to be able to get 
uh, and have access to those. And you have two kinds of companies. One is incumbent companies, which have already products, but they mm-hmm. want to adapt AI, mm-hmm. adapt into the new ways of doing things. And then there are AI native companies that are building from scratch and starting with a new one. I, I would say the whole industry is getting disrupted. So if you are incumbent and not moving fast enough, you will get disrupted. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, that, that's the number one. So for all the people who are having products, but they don't think they'll get disrupted, they will get disrupted, right? So that's mm-hmm. that piece. And, and then there's the AI native companies can rethink how the user interface should be when you had all these buttons in place and 20 things. You probably don't need that. You may want to have a simple text box where people ask to do things and it does things for you. It may be mm-hmm. much better interface. So that's something that AI native companies, product companies are doing. Uh, some of them may be using models underneath, but that doesn't matter, right? So what matters is, are they solving a problem that nobody else is solving? And is the user willing to pay for it, right? In terms of mm-hmm. building a company and having a uh, real go-to-market motion and building out a mm-hmm. much larger company. And those are all the aspects of things that we look at. And it's mm-hmm. it's hard to have a formula that you can publish. It's case by case, it's also the founder, it's the market and the area that they're in, it's the vision of the founder and the ambitions that they have. And also, I guess, how the company is doing. So it's number of things, but th- that all goes into our formula in terms of uh, how we decide as go to mm-hmm. and how we invest in companies. Totally. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one minute fire on for you. So number one, it's like, what's your favorite book? I, I love lots of books. My favorite book is uh, Thinking in Systems. Mm. Uh, and that has helped me to just think holistically in terms of uh, how do you think about a problem rather than just figuring out just the problem itself, but think about the larger context. Amazing. Uh, who made the biggest impact in your career? I would say my dad, because mm. the work ethics that I mentioned growing up has been like the pillar in terms of how I operate. Who would invite to your dinner party? That's a hard question. It, does it have to be living people? If yeah. not, it's it's Richard Feynman, my favorite person in the world where can we find you outside of work watching cricket i love cricket oh interesting uh, i used to play it a lot now i don't have as much time but my wife and i and family love hiking so you will find me in one of the hills around bay area amazing thank you so much three for coming on the show today this has been amazing great discussion thank you for having me